Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, performance analysis of uh, three different TC classifiers that uh, Lucas and I did. Uh, we thought it was going to be done around Christmas. That didn't happen. It took about six to eight weeks of our time. And we, we don't think this, this is not what we ended. We, were, we thought we we're going to eventually end up doing, but that's the result. It's a lot of slides, so I'm probably going to skip a lot of the uh, introductory stuff. Linux traffic control, if you don't know what it is, there's a paper in NetDev01, go ahead and read it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, other than to say there's a, uh, there's a couple of hooks on an egress port, uh, egress side of a port and an ingress side of a port. You can have classifiers of variety of classifiers that select a packet which then gets exercised through an action and may eventually get queued and will be scheduled, when you have multiple queues, it will be scheduled out of those, one of those queues depending on the scheduling algorithm. So if you have a deficit round robin, it may end up being one, uh, one or several packets out of each uh, queue that's going out uh, on over here. I'm not going to give a lot of details. You go and read the paper because we don't have a lot of time for this. Uh, just to focus on the small subset where you have the classifiers and the actions, you typically have a bunch of classification rules, each of which may be a totally different classification algorithm, and when that matches, an action gets executed. My, the talk today is just to focus on the portion here, which is uh, on, the, on the different classification algorithms. So, uh, TC allows you to have many different types of classifiers. The paradigm uh, is that you cannot have one specific classifier that is capable of doing everything or has the best algorithm forever. That in the future, should we decide to make changes, we can replace that classification algorithm with, uh, with the latest SIGCOM paper. So that is the overriding principle. That we allow many different classifiers. Unfortunately, that sometimes brings usability issues, because if you're used to one classifier that does X tuples or does string searches, uh, when a new one is introduced, they may be slightly different syntax. And there's complaints about that usability aspect. So what was the motivation for us to do this talk? Uh, there was. Over the last year, there have been two new classifiers. One is Flower, written by Yiri, which I'm going to touch on, and the BPF from Daniel, and uh, if you want to call it extended BPF, although we're not looking at the extended BPF in our talk, um, was Thomas. He tweeted a joke last year when I said, I haven't done any performance analysis since 2005. That was a motivation. I can't believe I put that bullet for him when he's not here. Uh, and this looked like a really easy paper, right? So when I first looked at it, I said, oh yeah, we just got to measure performance. Free classifiers, how hard that can be? Can that be? So I started working on this then, as I was sweating, I bumped into Lucas in the hallway, and I, I convinced him to work with me, because I well, you know you're going to be done by next weekend. It turned out that it wasn't, uh, it, I was being delusional, thinking it was an easy uh, thing to do. Uh, so. Uh, you know, uh, two months later, we are not completely done. We think we'll have another paper for the next conference that builds up on this work. Um, yeah, we've done a lot of work on uh, SDN our, in our day job where we do a lot of ASIC flow processing. So I was more curious after all these years, how does Linux compare? There's also a lot of... Uh, discussion on how good DPDK is, or NetMap, or things of that variant, that they outperform Linux 10 to 1 in a, on a typical run. Right, so I was curious. I wanted to find out. Right? So that, that was the motivation. You check the time just in case we, so we get to the final slides. So our system under test, we are not interested in doing a hash on a group of flows. That's so boring, right? We don't, we don't want to do what FE Codel or uh, 
the other hashing type algorithms do to, to sort of identify by five tuples what a group of flows looks like. We wanted to do path flow, because that's what we do on the ASICs. Analysis, each flow must at minimal have counters, right? It has to count packets and bytes. Sent, uh, and at some, in some cases received as well. And so one of the hardest things that took us in this long journey is how do you run these tests and be fair to uh, the users, uh, the, the different classifiers we're testing? Because a lot of, you know, benchmarking could be a marketing game, if you wish, or, uh, you know, biased in most cases. So we were trying, we have three classifiers, they are different algorithms, uh, they behave differently under different constraints, and how do we come up with a set of test cases that will be fair to, so we, we don't bias one against the other. So, in other words, compare oranges to oranges. So, uh, Flower, eBPF, or slide, I'm sorry, I should say classical BPF because we didn't get to the eBPF part. And then compare that. We need to pick something that existed for some time, so we picked U32. Uh, because uh, probably U32 is the most popular TC classifier at this point. It's also the most complex pro if you want to use it beyond its basic uh, feature set. So U32 also, we figured, okay, we could optimize U32, so fun was was also motivation in this case. We were gonna have fun if we can make this thing, we can, we can show the power of U32 a little bit. We're gonna flex its muscles. How are we doing on time? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about, I, I do not have a lot of time to talk about the details of each classifier, but I'll, in the case of eBPF, what you can see, is there a pointer uh, I could use? A pointer? Or, or I'll just... So eBPF works by... It's got a machine language where you have a few instructions. If I had a second uh, set of... Uh, if I could project another one, I, if I had another projector, I would show you the machine code that it outputs. There's a lot of... Uh, users of eBPF, most popular probably is all the sniffers, TCP dump, Wireshark, underneath they run pickup, which injects BPF uh, machine code or byte code into the kernel at a socket filter level, and it's a classifier essentially, a very powerful classifier. It comes with machine instructions to load and to compare, that's it. And it has a bunch of registers, so the classical uh, BPF has two uh, uh, registers 32-bit, the eBPF, which Alexi discussed in NetDev01, has a bunch more registers and uh, uh, a bunch more 64-bit instructions for, as opposed to 32-bit. So it's a lot more power that has been extended, but that's not what I'm discussing. I did not have time to get to it. Uh, so we are not going to talk about eBPF in this talk. We're just talking about what exists today on the CLS BPF and where it uses the extended bytecode, but we're not gonna go into a lot of details. What, what you need to, to see is, this is how a BPF classification rule would look like. You have a bunch of instructions which load a packet offset of some form, and then does a compare to what's to be expected, and if it succeeds, it proceeds to return a true, if it doesn't, it's a false. Linux did extend BPF so that you can actually return something more than uh, true or false. So that's a Linux extension, right? So that's why I said the classic Linux way. Uh, BPF is a forward DAG, as you can see. It, it's, uh, uh, it's unidirectional. It can branch, but it can't loop back, right? There's no loops. And because it's machine code instruction, this is why different classifiers have different attributes. It's machine code, essentially. So you have LU instructions, basically registers, uh, load instructions, compare. You can very easily take that instruction set and map it to any uh, CPU instruction set. So just-in-time compilers evolved over time. So now about every architecture on Linux has BPF with a JIT 
built in. So when you're running bytecode in the kernel, you're running machine instructions. Right? And I, I believe other operating systems have that these days. Right? What did BPF classic, uh, the classifier that's uh, from BPF, the CLS BPF does is it, you can take now instead of the single programlet, like the big blob, you can actually take multiple and combine them, right? So you can have little programs or little proglets that can be serialized. See, the, the, the gray box there is essentially one of those, right? And now you can actually uh, serialize them. You can also have uh, them loop back. Uh, so, so you can have branches as well as loops if you wanted. As I, as I was showing you earlier on, this is what TC allows you to do, is you can actually look back and pick another rule based on some condition of your choice, based on what the action that you want to execute next. So we, we basically end up adding uh, loops. Um, Daniel uh, Bachman was probably here, wrote the CLS uh, BPF. He uh, reuses a, a, Existing uh, BPF based Linux packet filter. The code is the same, basically, BPF program run. It's the same as used on the socket as it's, it is on, on, on the TCCLS. There's also another extension that was made where BPF bytecode could be used for actions. I'm not going to talk about that. Right? We didn't have time. Like I said, we started thinking this is simple, realized we were delusional, and just had to focus on a specific set of tasks. Uh, so what TC basically uh, allows for BPF to have is you don't need this big monolithic code now. You can actually have small pieces of object code that combine together produce a more meaningful result. Uh, and the ability to create loops. Flower is the other classifier that we were interested in. It was written by Yiri. It started historic, so NetDev01, Yiri presented a paper where he was demonstrating how to, uh, to, do flow, uh, to do open flow 15, 14 tuple or whatever using TC. When he submitted the patches, David Miller suggested to, for him to go back and see if he can tie it to the uh, flow cache. So this classifies, it utilizes the Linux flow cache, which is populated at different stages of the, of the uh, kernel stack. So if, you're, if your packet is coming in from uh, the, and on an ingress side, the flow cache is built up as you traverse or you bubble up different layers of the stack. And uh, if you are going out, outdoors towards the egress, thanks, you are, okay. If you're going down the stack, you are basically, the flow cache is built at the different layers. By the time you hit the egress port, you got your flow cache fully constructed and you can use that to classify. So very clever idea. Uh, and this, in my opinion, should be, in under real circumstances, would be the best classifier you can use if you want to use it with Linux, because it's getting for free all this flow cache that was already existing, and th therefore could uh, be the most effective, in other, in other words. I was a bit unfair in these tests, uh, we, as, as I'll demonstrate, because we made a Flower uh, rebuild its flow cache every single time during the test. So it's the worst case scenario that Flower can perform. It's, and, unfortunately, I, we try to be fair, oranges with oranges, but with Flower, we may have been a little unfair in our tests. So basically, uh, yeah, it works. Okay, so. Uh, when a packet comes into Flower, you, the Flower algorithm checks if it has the cache, if, if it's cached already. In other words, does the, uh, is the flow cache for that packet existing? Otherwise, it reconstructs. It calls the whole slew of uh, flow cache uh, builders. And then it looks in, in, into its database, which is an rhash table, does a bunch of mem compares, and if it finds it, it proceeds to return, uh, to execute the actions associated with that uh, rule. If it doesn't find it, then you know, it returns to the calling uh, classification code. So 
Uh, our hash table is another thing that showed up over the last year. It's optimized for key-based hash uh, table implementation. Uh, so that's how the algorithm works, and it currently supports source destination mark, ether type, source destination IP, source destination transport port, ingress, which port, if it was being routed or switched, which port it came on. There's a few other uh, flow cache attributes that are not being used at the moment, MPLS labels, VLAN IDs, GRE keys, and even tipsy. Uh, and as new fields are being added over time uh, onto the flow cache, Flower should be able to make use of them. So, very nice uh, classifier, very human friendly. Right, so the people are complaining about TC not being friendly. You you like Flower, and if I had another projector, we could we could have demonstrated it for you. All right. So now, the only the ugly thirty it's actually called the ugly thirty two classifier, or it's not U doesn't stand for unsigned. It stands for ugly or universal. You go and read the source code, you'll see it at the very top. It says, this is the universal or, sorry, I, can't, I don't have another projector, but I could have shown you the comment. It's pretty funny, actually. It, re, it deserves a t-shirt of its own. The universal or ugly classifier, that's what U stands for, right? So I'm not going to go into a lot of details other than say that uh, it's very nicely constructed uh, series of hash tables that you can script. So if you know your traffic patterns or you know exactly what you want to classify, with U32, you can build your multi-try, which is actually with something we're going to be showing in, this, uh, in one of our tests. You can take hash on some source IP, point it to another hash table, which hashes on a destination IP. So you can reduce a million flow lookup to maybe four or five if you wished. But you have to know uh, the, how you want to arrange your traffic lookups, right? So every hash table has an address. Hex 800 uh, is the default IP, is, is the default hash table ID. So when you just add rules without looking at how they add it, they all add it to hash table number 800, which has only one bucket, it's bucket zero. And then there's a link list that follows. And the filters reside over here. So each filter has a 32-bit address. If you go and add a rule and then you dump it, you'll see some weird numbers of this form. Right, to say hash table ID, hash, I, I think this is referred to as a hash table bucket. I could be wrong, I don't have anything in front of me. Uh, and the node ID, node ID is one of these, so each node has another ID. So if I look at this, there's 32 bit key to the filter. It tells me how I traverse this to, my, to find the filter. And each filter has an offset length. So you say, look at this offset on the packet, let's say offset 12, which is of IP header is source IP, I think. Uh, match with the following uh, value. M match, use the following mask, and it has to be the following value. So very powerful from a machine level description. This is moment if you're writing an automated or uh, programmatic kind of uh, um, application, this would be fantastic to use. So, and you can have a bunch of these nod nodes. By, by default, it's a linked list. So when you just blindly add rules, they get added into a linked list. Uh, so it's a bit tricky, it's not as user friendly, but you don't have to know these details if you just, you're running your home router or a small router, you can just add them in a linked list. What the power it provides is, you can, this, this is an example of how you can rearrange uh, the, the rules I just showed. Set your first hash table to say, on bucket zero, I want it to look at this mask at offset 12, and if it matches, I want it to use hash table number one. The link one points to the hash table one. And then on each of these buckets, you add rules, right? So you could do this in a bash script. And what is important is to be able to understand what you're trying to mask on. You're telling the packet as it, as it comes in how to traverse during its lookups and eventually find uh, a match which is uh, preceded by an action, or a graph of actions to, to, to uh, compute. 
Anybody confused? Anybody who hasn't used U32? I'm, I'm surprised the majority have used it. Okay, I'm, I'm not in hostile territory here. <laughs> but, but basically the, the power is that I can script things. I can totally look at what my traffic patterns are, for example, and I can, I can uh, create an optimal hash table for me. So if I have customers who are running PPP, which is why I've seen most people do this, uh, is I can optimize. So with two lookups, I can find what flow it is exactly, and I can have counters for every flow. Right? And I've seen people uh, talk about some really huge numbers. Now, BPF is the other one that is capable of doing this extended BPF. If you write a little program, you can achieve similar goal, but you have to write a program as opposed to writing a script. So now it comes back to what do we want to measure for, for our testing? How do we do a fair test? Oranges, oranges. So there are several metrics we could look at. One was data path throughput performance. If I add certain rules using uh, where the classifier is U32 versus BPF versus uh, uh, flower, what is, how many packets per second can I get? That's always the easy thing to do, right? You, you want to just add these rules, fire a bunch of packets, and see what the output is. So that was an easy one. So we were, we, our first goal was to tag it. I'm going to send, I'm going to install a rule. I don't know where yet, because that's, that's always the challenge. And fire a bunch of packets and see how many of them actually make it out of there in a specific period of time. What's the packets per second? What's the bytes per second? The other one was, which is a little tricky, was if we could uh, uh, measure the latency, right? So I've added rules. What is the latency on the packet? So I'm going to send a packet, find a way to measure that at the time it entered the rule from the, uh, to the time it departed, what latency was five minutes. Well, OK. I don't know if we will have time to finish this. OK, so we, we just focused on the data throughput performance. Uh, next is, how do we pick a system under test that was uh, reasonable to, uh, to test? One of the things we were shooting for is we want to reduce the, the effect of locks because our system under test is the classifier. Okay, we're not here to test uh, what the QDisk lock looks like. It just gets in the way of saying, the, if the QDisk is overhead, how do we get uh, to the to our system under test? We're not here to test drivers. We don't want to test the I40E to see what overhead it has before it hits the classifier. Uh, we so we tried our best to just focus on the system under test, which is the classifier, right? So this is how we pick up the battle scenes. There's several places we could have done a performance, over here or over here, and it was hard to start selecting. We had to select one spot and justify why, right? So the, in order to reduce the uh, overhead, we, this, is, this was initially our goal, okay? We were gonna send packets from outside, come to some driver, and then measure performance at different spots. And as well, we're going to send packets from packaging up above, but it needed uh, us not to bypass the QDisk because filters are attached to QDisk. The current packaging only uh, always bypass the QDisk. Right? So, uh, OK, at that point, we say, OK, let's get rid of the driver overhead. OK, we will put a dummy device here instead of a, a real driver, which will just suck the packets out. It will just drop them. And then on the ingress, we're going to get rid of every driver and instead just uh, send packets uh, up through the ingress hook for packet gen. So it pretends it's coming from a driver, but it doesn't have the overhead of dealing with a driver. Uh, and so this looked like the battle scene eventually, right? There's a bunch of places we could put drops and measure the performance of the classifiers. As we went through this, we realized, two weeks later, we realized we have thousands of tests we had to run. Uh, so we needed to narrow it to just one spot. And then either the ingress or the egress, pick one, right? So some of our tests, so we, you have the device? Yeah, so we, we picked up this Intel NAC, which is a little device 
uh, Lucas is just going to grab the, um, the device. It's an i7, it's a nice device. You can put it in your backpack. It's got a, a quad, uh, I, uh, it's an i7 quad core, 3.1 gigahertz. We bought the fastest RAM we could find, which was uh, 16 gig of 1600 megahertz. Maybe bring it up here. And we picked a kernel. And the kernel we picked at that point was NetNext uh, 441 uh, RC1. And uh, there's some issues with, uh, with Flower, and we had to patch packet gen uh, to not bypass the QDisk, the uh, egress QDisk. Uh, so that's our test setup. We picked the kernel. Uh, that's the device. If anybody wants to pay attention afterwards, you can come over and see us. Um, all right, so as I was pointing out, this was the battle scene, right? So one of the first drops is here. We say, OK, let's send a packet all the way here, add and drop the packets here. Then we were going to add the Q disk. No class, no rules. We want to see the overhead of the Q disk itself. And then eventually, um, so as you can see, dropping at IP receive was, now this is where, I, I, I put these numbers on purpose. They show megabits per second as opposed to packets per second. Uh, what we observed is it doesn't matter what the packet size is. The performance was, the PPS was consistent regardless of the packet size, which means the overhead of dealing with every packet was the same, regardless of the tests we did. So now I'm, I'm playing some marketing bullshit here for you. I'm going to just show the megabits per second. You can see that dropping at IP receive, Linux can do up to 250 gigabits per second, right? At 250 gigabits per second, uh, but of course, uh, that is not very meaningful. It's about 1,000 byte packets. Uh, at at 1,000 byte packet here, you can see that we hit about 250 gigabits, and it's almost, it's not exactly linear, but it varies on the packet size. I guess I'm not going to be able to finish the presentation here. Yeah, we, should I stop? Is it 30 minutes already? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Okay, conclusions. All right, I'm just gonna jump. I think all, all the slides are important. Here's IP receive with one rule, one tuple. You can see the different classifiers that we selected and their performance. Uh, eventually, we looked at the packet size, and as I said, the different the packet sizes, we, there's no variance. The minimum and the maximum of about 10 runs was very minimal. Uh, so we, 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 gonna, we cut out the fact that we needed to do the, uh, uh, we just picked the average every single time. We didn't have to bother capturing the minimum and the maximum. Packet sizes, as I said, didn't matter. As you can see that as we varied the packet size, the packets per second with just dropping at IP receive was in the 30 million range. Again, please observe, this is one CPU, okay? We're not trying to, multi, uh, to run this on multiple CPUs. Um, and as we, and all of them basically had, it doesn't matter what the packet size is. So we ended up picking for our tests just the final packet size. Uh, we then ignored BPF because BPF JIT was always better. And uh, the one versus five, five tuples, we figured five tuples was a better test instead of one. And you can see the difference is not very huge for all the classifiers at 1020 byte packets. We use five tuple because it's more realistic. Uh, this, is, this is something I'm going to go to Jesper's uh, uh, BOF, should all come, it's network performance. We observed some very strange numbers with just black hole routing, as you can see. If I dropped an IP receive, and Alex is probably going to argue about this, that we saw performance drop by about 10 times. We, 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 we have the, the device with us. We have the performance numbers. We can, show, we can repeat these tests. Again, at this point, we decided not to do anything towards the forwarding. We baseline the egress, which is you know, taking packets from packet gen on the egress and sending them down. And we, re and we decided to drop this test as well. Uh, so taking stock of what all the baselining. So up to this point, we're just doing baselining, OK? We're not really running the test. Uh, what we realized was 
the ingress can handle a lot of throughput. There's things that are slower, we could probably improve their performance. It's not the QDisk that was the overhead, it's the routing code at this point, is, our, is, our, is the uh, lesson to take. Uh, I believe we, if we had put slower RAM, like 13, 33 megahertz, profiles were showing that the problem was not so much the CPU cycles, it was the mem comps and the mem sets. That's what was showing in the, in, on the display. So I wanted to go and buy some RAM which is slower, but it's very hard to find slow RAM these days. So we have 16 mega, 100 megahertz, but if we could find a 13, 33 megahertz uh, RAM uh, dim. So eventually we settled on just doing things on the egress and dropping the packet and accounting for it. Uh, that's it. So this is where we ended up running the tests. Uh, you can see the different, uh, again I said I was being unfair to, BP, uh, to Flower because Flower every time had to recompute the uh, flow cache. BPF JIT versus U32, U32 was a little better, uh, as you can see from the PPS numbers. Then we decided, okay, now let's start varying the number of flows and the number of uh, rules. You can see that as, uh, with one flow versus two versus 10 versus 100 and 1,000, everything collapses. It collapses because this is a single linked list. And if you want to see the details, you can see that U32 outperformed them, but you know, it's kind of embarrassing when, you can, when with a single rule you can do in the 200 gig range and with 1,000 rules you're down to 463 megabits per second. And last, we, we decided, okay, we're gonna script U32 as I was describing earlier, to match 64,000 flows. And these are the numbers. So here's one flow only with one rule with U32. Here's the 1,000 rules. Here's the scripted version of uh, U32 with 64,000 flows and rules. Basically, packaging is generating 64,000 flows as opposed to the one flow it does here or a thousand that it does here, and we have 64,000 rules that are split into a multi-try hash with three levels, so four lookups. I can find any flow out of the 64,000 flows in four lookups. We did not spend a lot of time doing this. Uh, there's a few gotchas, I'll, I'll probably talk about them in the uh, performance uh, uh, buff. I don't know if I have much time I have, but you know, there's the iron triangle you pick between uh, classify, you either pick performance, usability, or extensibility. So I'm gonna hand wave on this, say that as far as performance is concerned, U32 is still very good. Uh, as far as extensibility, PPF is the winner. As far as usability, uh, Flower is the winner. Right? Uh, and, Sorry, I, I, I skimmed through this, some of this stuff, but the paper will, and the slides will be online, and the paper will have a lot more details. Thanks, Jamal. Thank you.